And hello everyone. And who was it real fast uh, that said they were starting? Uh, Alan Leminski. Oh, you're going to start up a YouTube channel to film? Sounds pretty cool. I'll look forward to it. Let me know when you get that going so I, subscribe, uh, so I can subscribe and keep an eye on that channel there. Anyway, I am still suffering from the effects of a nasty little head cold that I got from some obviously little a bunch of little kids and all that stuff over the holidays we know how uh, family meetups can be a nice little germ vector and unfortunately I still end up getting it even though I took a bunch of stuff to uh, up my resistance to d colds and all that stuff but we all know how that goes but nonetheless <clears throat> anyway while I said that there is quite a few decent little things we need to read about one of those is Turner V Driver. I know quite a few of you that have been tuning into my channel for a while now has heard at least the oral argument, but how many of you have actually read it? This decision came out at the beginning of the year, and it was quite the uh, nice victory on our side, especially because it was brought to us by Philip Turner, also known as the Batosai with his YouTube channel. And anyway, and hello everybody that's tuning in and all that stuff. I see quite a few popped in there. And yes, I do apologize about the stream cut in and out because I, um, how should I put it? I was messing with settings and I forgot to change it back to the original when I was streaming. So I was actually just streaming to YouTube. So I had to stop the stream and flip a few switches real fast. So this way I'm streaming both the Twitch and Periscope at the same time. And... <clears throat> Might as well go ahead and get this off the thing. Let me take a sip of some soda here so I can burn the back of my throat and the mucus and all that bad stuff. Oh, the burn. It feels good, though. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and get go, uh, started with this. Philip Turner, plaintiff, versus Lieutenant Driver in his individual capacity, Oster uh, Grinnold's uh, badge number 3825 his, in, in his individual capacity Officer Diaz badge number 2586 in his individual capacity so instead of this being specifically against an individual uh, against a police force in its full capacity this was just filed against the actual uh, individual officers which makes it a little bit different from the prior case laws that we have read so far <clears throat> Before Wiener, Klamath, and Higginson, Circuit Court Judges, Wiener, Circuit Judge. Okay, Plaintiff, uh, um, Plaintiff Philip Turner was video recording at Fort Worth Police Station from a public sidewalk across the street when defendants, a, poly, uh, a, a defendant, Officer uh, Gr Gerald's, Grinnell's, oh, man, I, I cannot pronounce stuff. This is going to be a tough night for me. And Diaz approached him and asked him for identification. Turner refused to identify himself, and the officers ultimately handcuffed him and placed him in the back of a patrol car. The officer's supervisor, uh, Lieutenant Driver, arrived on scene, and after Driver checked with Grounds and Diaz and talked with Turner, the officers released Turner. He filed suit against all three officers and the city of Fort Worth under 42 U.S.C. 1983, alleging violations of his First and Fourth Amendment rights. Each officer filed a motion to dismiss, insisting that he was entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's claims. The district court granted the officers' motions, concluding that they were entitled to qualified immunity on all of Turner's claims against them. Turner timely ap uh, appealed, we affirm um, in part and reverse and remand in part. What is the okay. <clears throat> Part 1. Facts and Proceedings. Facts. In September 2015, Turner videotaped Fort Worth Police Station from a public sidewalk across the street from the station. He was unarmed. While videotaping, Turner observed Fort Worth Police Officer Grinnells and Diaz pull up in a patrol car in front of the, uh, the station, get out, and approach him. Grinnells asked Turner, how's it going, man? Got your ID with you? Turner continued videotaping, and Grinnells repeatedly asked Turner if he had any identification. Turner asked the officers whether he was being detained. The generals respond that Turner was being detained for investigation and that officers were concerned about who was walking around with a video camera. 
Turner asked for which crime he was being detained. And Grinnells replied, I don't, uh, I didn't say you committed a crime, Grinnells elaborated. We have the right and authority to know who is walking around our facilities. Grinnells again asked Turner, uh, Turner's uh, identification, and Turner asked Grinnells, what happened if I don't ID myself? Grinnells replied, we'll cross that bridge when we, uh, when we come to it. Grinnells continued to request Turner's identification, which Turner refused to provide Grinnells, uh, provide. Okay, let's scroll down here. Grinnells and Diaz then suddenly, without warning, handcuffed Turner and took his video camera from him. And Grinnells said, this is what happens when you don't ID yourself. Yo. Okay. Turner's requested to see a supervisor. Uh, Grinnells continued to ask for Turner's ID and told him he would be uh, fingerprinting uh, fingerprinted so he could uh, learn his identity. The officers placed handcuffs on Turner in the back of the patrol car and left him there to sweat for a while without the windows rolled down uh, with the windows rolled up. Turner alleges that no air was getting into the back seat uh, that he banged on the door so officers would roll down the windows. Lieutenant driver approached Grinnells and Diaz and they seemingly ignored Turner the three officers then rolled down the windows of the patrol car and found Turner laying down in the back seat. Lieutenant Driver identified himself as the commander. Driver asked Turner what he was doing, and Turner explained that he was taking pictures from a sidewalk across the street. Driver asked Turner for his ID, and Turner told the lieutenant that he did not have ident um, to identify himself because he had not been lawfully arrested, and <clears throat> that he could uh, choose not no and that he choose not to provide an identification. Debra responded, you're right. Driver walked away and talked with officers and then returned uh, to the patrol car and talked with Turner. Turner said, you guys need to let me go because I haven't done anything wrong. Driver again walked away from the car, talked on the phone and spoke further with the officers. They returned to the car and took Turner out of the back seat. Driver lectured Turner and the officers finally released him and returned his camera to him. <clears throat> quite interesting well let's see here so they they actually admit in the briefing or at least in the facts um, of the proceeding that they put him in the back seat of the car to ha let him sweat it out that is quite the uh, important part I would say within the uh, the lawsuit proceedings in October 2015 Turner filed suit in Northern District uh, of Texas against Driver, Reynolds and Diaz, collectively, uh, collectively defendants, in their individual capacities. Each officer filed a motion to dismiss under Rule 12b-6 of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Turner filed an amended complaint in January 2016, adding the City of Fort Worth as a defendant. Turner brought claims under 42 U.S.C. 1983. All defendants alleging that they violated the First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendment rights. Turner sought uh, compensatory, uh, compensatory uh, I know I mispronounced that, damages, punitive damages, attorney fees, and costs, the declaratory and declaratory judgment that the defendants had violated his constitutional rights. Three of the three officers filed motion to dismiss Turner's amended complaint. The district court granted the motion to dismiss on the basis of qualified immunity. The court reasoned Turner failed to meet the burden of showing that the defendants were not entitled to qualified immunity because he failed to show that their actions violated any of his clearly established statutory or constitutional rights or that their actions were objectively reasonable. Turner timely applied. Now to move on to the standards of review. And this is 26 pages long, but uh, looks like I'm getting through at a decent pace here. <clears throat> Burn, 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 burn. And what's nice is they actually put in, uh, at the bottom of the pages, the actual citations for references in uh, their cases. I, I really like how uh, the Fifth Circuit does their um, uh, case law opinions when it comes to the write-up. We review a district uh, court's grant of motion to dismiss based on qualified immunity, de novo. We accept all well-preceded, uh, well-pleaded facts as true and view them in the light of most favorable to the non-movement. Uh, 
To, survi um, to survive a motion to dismiss, a complaint must contain sufficient factual matter uh, accepted as true. To uh, state a claim of uh, to relief that is plausible on its face, a claim has a facial plausibility when the plaintiff pleads factual content that allows the court to draw a reasonable inference that the defendant is liable for misconduct alleged. A uh, threadbare recital of the elements uh, of cause of action supported by mere conclusionary statements not uh, do not suffice. Although a complaint does not need detailed factual allegations, the allegations must be enough to raise a right to relief above the speculative level. Conclusionary allegations or legal conclusions masquerading as factual conclusions will not suffice to, um, suffice to prevent a motion to dismiss. Now moving into the analysis. To state claim under 42 U.S.C. 1983, plaintiff must first show a violation of constitutional or federal law and then show that the violation was committed by someone acting under the color of state law. The doctrine of qualified immunity protects government officials from civil damages, liability, and their actions could reasonably have been believed to be legal. When a defendant raises a qualified immunity defense, the plaintiff has the burden of demonstrating the inapplicability uh, in uh, <laughs> in of the defense. To meet the burden, the plaintiff must show that the official violated a statutory or constitutional right, and two, the right was clearly established at the time of the challenged conduct. Likewise, the court, we have the discretion to decide which prong, uh, which prong of the qualified immunity analysis to address first. <clears throat> and of course, they start with the First Amendment. <laughs> okay, starting uh, A, First Amendment. The district court concluded that the defendants were entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's First Amendment claim because he failed to demonstrate that the defendants' actions violated a clearly established right or that the, their actions were objectively unreasonable. In particular, the district court ruled the, that a First Amendment right to video record police activity was not clearly established. The district court's analysis uh, rested on the second clearly established prong where we begin... Uh, so we begin there. One, whether the right was clearly established in September 2015. For the right to clearly, uh, clearly be established, the contours of the right must be sufficiently clear that a reasonable officer official would understand that he is doing uh, what he is doing violates that right. Thus, the right must already be clearly established at that time of the challenge conduct. When considering whether a defendant is entitled to qualified immunity. The court must ask whether the clock is so clearly and unambiguously prohibit his conduct that every reasonable official would understand that he is doing uh, what he is doing violates the law. To answer the question in affirmative, um, in the affirmative, we must be able to point to a controlling authority or a robust consensus of persuasive authority that defines the contours of the right uh, in question with high degree of particularity. No. Anyway, I'm gonna pause here for a moment. Um, and this is actually part, uh, important reason why, uh, getting all these case laws, uh, put out there and why having, uh, getting a majority of the, uh, district courts of appeal, the federal district court of appeals to decide on, um, in favor of filming. Once we have a good portion of the court saying, yes, this is a legal right that's established. Those states that reside in uh, district court, federal district court, uh, court of appeals era jurisdictions that haven't decided will have no uh, plausible deniability to uh, really give qualified immunity to, uh, to officers when you have a majority of the nation uh, federal appeals court saying it is a legal right to film police and government officials in their official capacity. And something that needs to be established uh, that we are working on establishing, especially since we just had three decisions come out this year on this, if I remember correctly, or at least two. I know I read two. I think there's a third one. I, I got to go back and check my records here. But anyway, let's continue on. Where no controlling authority specifically prohibits a defendant, uh, defendant's conduct, and when the federal circuit courts are split on the issue, the law cannot be said to be clearly established. And currently, uh, there isn't really much of a divide, though there is a case law out of the Eighth Circuit 
that um, some people are saying um, that is in the opposite direction. I actually, in my own opinion, disagree with that. And I plan on covering that issue specifically next month. Um, that is going to be a very long and complicated read, but it will be one definitely worth listening into for those that want to learn about this stuff. And uh, nothing much, just reading case law, buddy. So I uh, hope you guys are enjoying this, and hopefully I'm not sounding too monotone and too stuffed up right now. <clears throat> All right, continuing on. Uh, this is true when the circuits, uh, circuit split developed after the events in question. As the Supreme Court has explained, if judges disagree on a constitutional question, it is unfair to subject police to money damages for picking the losing side of the controversy. At first, uh, at the fir uh, time in question, neither the Supreme Court nor the courts, uh, this court had determined whether the First Amendment protection extends to the recording or filming of police. Although Turner insists that as some district courts in his circuit uh, in this circuit have concluded that First Amendment protections extend to video recording of police activity in light of general First Amendment uh, principles. The Supreme Court has repeatedly instructed courts not to, uh, to define clearly established law at a high level of generality. The general pro uh, proposition, for example, that an unreasonable search or seizure violates the Fourth Amendment is of little help in determining whether the um, volative nature a particular uh, conduct is clearly established. Thus, Turner's reliance on decision that certified the First Amendment protections extend to gathering information does not demonstrate whether the specific act, uh, act at issue here, video recording the police or police station, was clearly established. The district court stated that the circuit courts are split to, uh, as to whether or not it is clearly established First Amendment right to record public activities of uh, police. The circuit courts are split, um, are not split, however, on whether the right exists. The first and 11th circuits have held that First Amendment protects the right to individual, uh, individuals to videotape police officers performing their duties. In American Civil Liberties Union versus Alvarez, the seventh circuit explained that the First Amendment protects the audio recording of police and concluded uh, that an Illinois wiretap statute that which criminalized the audio recording of police officers merited a heightened First Amendment scrutiny because it burdens on the First Amendment rights. No circuit has held the First Amendment uh, protection does not extend to video recording of police activity. Although several circuits, uh, circuit, uh, circuit courts have explained that the law, uh, the law in their respective circuits is not clearly established while refraining from determining whether there is a First Amendment right to record the police. We cannot say, however, that existing precedent placed the constitutional question beyond debate. When Turner recorded the police station, neither does it seem that the, uh, the law so clearly and unambiguously prohibited the officer's conduct that every reasonable of, um, official would understand what, uh, that what he is doing violates the law. In light of the absence of controlling authority and dearth of even per, uh, persuasive authority, there was no clearly established First Amendment right to record the police at the time of Turner's activities. All three officers are entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's First Amendment claim. Whether the right is clearly established henceforth, although the right is clearly um, not clearly established at the time of Turner's activities, whether such a right exists is protected by First Amendment presents a separate and distinct question. Because the issue continues to arise in qualified immunity context, we now proceeded to, uh, to determine it for the future. We conclude the First Amendment pr uh, principles, controlling authority, and persuasive precedent demonstrates that a First Amendment right to record police does ex uh, exist, subject only to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. Once again, we see reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions pop up. And this is actually going to be a crux issue in the Eighth Circuit uh, ruling uh, when I reach that because a lot of these uh, courts this year that are talking about this look at reasonable time place and manner restrictions so let us continuing on <clears throat> the First Amendment protects freedom of speech and freedom of the press but the First Amendment goes beyond protection of the press and the self-expression uh, self 
of individuals to prohibit government from limiting the stock uh, um, stock information from which members of public may draw. News gathering, for example, is entitled to First Amendment protection for without some protection for seeking out news, freedom of the press can, uh, could be eviscerated. Could this, um, even though this right does not, uh, is not absolute, the Supreme Court has also recognized First Amendment right to receive information and ideas. And there is an undoubtable right to gather news from any source by any means within the law. Furthermore, the Supreme Court has long recognized that the First Amendment protects film, a uh, corollary, uh, corollary to this principle, is that the First Amendment protects the act of making film. As there is no fixed First Amendment line between the act of creating speech and the speech itself. <clears throat> Damn, my voice. Indeed, the Supreme Court has never drawn a dis uh, distinction between the process of creating a form of pure speech, such as writing or painting, and the product of these um, processes, the essay or the artwork, in terms of First Amendment protection afforded. Although writing and painting can be reduced to their const um, constituent acts, and thus described as conduct, we have not attempted to disconnect the end product from the act of creation. This is a very important argument right here. And of course, you got some citations down here that uh, we might want to scroll back and if we have time to check that out. In addition, the First Amendment protection of broader right to film the principle underlying and First Amendment support this particular right to film police. There is practically universal agreement that major purpose of the First Amendment was to protect free um, the free discussion of government uh, governmental affairs. To be sure, speech is an essential mechanism of uh, uh, <clears throat> of democracy. For the, uh, for it, this means to hold officials accountable to uh, the people. The right of citizens to inquire, to hear, to speak, and to use information to reach a uh, reach consensus is pr uh, preconditioned to enlightened, self-governing, and a necessary means to protect it. Filming the police contributes to the public ability to hold their police accountable ensure police officers are not abusing their power and to make informed decisions about the police uh, about police policy filming the police also frequently helps officers for example a citizen recording might co uh, corroborate a probable cause finding or might even exonerate an officer charged with wrongdoing as one court explained gathering information about government officials in a form that can readily be uh, disseminated to others serves as a cardinal First Amendment interest in protecting and promoting the free discussion of government affairs. Moreover, as the Supreme Court has noted, freedom of expression has particular significance with respect of government because it is here that the state has a special incentive to re um, repress opposition and often wields more effective power of suppression. This, um, this is particularly true of law enforcement officials who are granted substantial discretion that they may uh, be misused to deprive an individuals of their uh, liberties, ensuring, um, ensuring the public's right to gather information about their officials not only aids in uncovering of abuse, but also may have a statutory effect on the functioning of government more generally. Protecting the right uh, to film police promotes First Amendment principles. <clears throat> pause here and take a drink but this is quite interesting and also we're seeing uh, with the other case laws that we have read in the past uh, repeats of the same arguments being played over and over so if any of you are looking to file a lawsuit against law enforcement over some rights uh, that have been violated or are defending themselves for uh, against charges um, for filming police officers these things are going to be what you want to look at and be able to put into uh, your court paperwork and all that stuff. Let me take a drink here. <clears throat> oh boy, that burns. But it's sort of effective. <clears throat> Got me stuffed how Bunny Boots sits on... <laughs> that stick. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, well, that's my cane, and it works as an effective uh, way of uh, 
uh, reducing the amount of pressure that's on my knees and I'm not putting too much on uh, one knee over the other and stuff like that. All right, let's continue on. We agree with the circuit that has ruled on this question. Each has concluded the First Amendment protects the right to record the police. As First Circuit explained, the filming of government officials engaged in their duties is a um, is in a public place, including police officers performing their responsibilities, fits comfortably within basic First Amendment principles. This right, however, is not without limitations. Like all speech, filming the police may be subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. In this case, however, we do not uh, we need not decide which specific time, place, and manner restrictions would be reasonable. Nonetheless, we note that when police departments or officials adopt time, place, and manner restrictions, damn, my nose is itching, uh, those restrictions must be narrowly, uh, narrowly tailored to serve significant governmental interests. That said, to be constitutionally permissible, a time, place, and manner restriction need not be uh, the least restrictive or least intrusive means of serving government interests be Fourth Amendment. Turner also insists that he has an, uh, in, uh, has asserted a plausible claim under 1983 to which the defendants are not immune. The officers violated Fourth Amendment rights to be free from detention absent of reasonable suspicion and to warrantless arrest absent of probable cause because Lieutenant Driver did not arrive on scene until Officer Grinnells and Diaz had already handcuffed Turner and placed him in the back of the patrol car, we first analyzed whether Grinnells and Diaz are entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's first and Fourth Amendment claims. Officer Grinnells and Diaz, detention. <clears throat> a detention. Turner alleges Grinnells and Diaz initially questioned him uh, of him, violated his Fourth Amendment right to be free from a detention absent of reasonable suspicion. The police can stop and briefly detain a person for investigative purposes if the officer has reasonable suspicion supported by the articulable facts that a crime, uh, criminal activity may be afoot. The Supreme Court has said repeatedly that when determining whether officers have reasonable suspicion, courts must look at the totality of circumstances of each case to see whether the detaining officer has a partic uh, particularized and objective base for suspecting legal wrongdoing. Courts considered only that the information available to the officers at the time of the decision uh, to stop a person. Even if we are assuming uh, Argun Arguindo, uh, I guess that's how you pronounce it, uh, I'll have to look that up later, that uh, Grinnells and Diaz violated Turner's Fourth Amendment rights by detaining him without reasonable suspicion, we cannot say that this detention was objectively unreasonable in light of clearly established law. An individual right to be free from detention absent <coughs> of uh, reasonable suspicion was clearly established well before the actions given uh, giving a rise to the case. But this general claim that a seizure under Fourth Amendment must be based on reasonable suspicion is particularly uh, precisely the type of general uh, proposition the Supreme Court has rejected. Whether a right is clearly established at the time the defendant acted requires an assessment of whether the official conduct would have been objectively reasonable at the time of the incident. Courts must ask whether the law so clearly and unambigu uh, unambiguously prohibited this conduct that every reasonable official would understand that uh, what he is doing violates the law. The Fourth Amendment is concerned with ensuring the scope of a given detention is reasonable under the, to uh, uh, the totality of the circumstances. Turner alleges that when Grinnells and Diaz approached him, he was videotaping the police station while walking on the sidewalk across the street during midday. Nothing in that amended complaint suggests that Turner was videotaping arrest, a traffic stop, or any other action or activity being performed by the police in the course of their duties. On contrary, Turner's complaint states that he was filming only the routine activities of Fort Worth Police Department building. On appeal, Grinnells and Diaz referenced several attacks on police stations and um, police officers and police stations, including those in Dallas and Austin, uh, and the resulting increase in security at police station. It is appropriate for the police to take in, uh, into account the location of suspicious conduct and the degree of potential danger being investigated. What is not suspicious in one location may be highly suspicious in another. 
Turner's filming in front of a police station potentially threatened security procedures at a location where order was paramount. An objectively reasonable person in Grinnell's uh, or Diaz's position would have suspected that Turner was casing the station for an attack, stalking an officer, or otherwise preparing for criminal activity, and thus could have found Turner's filming of the routine activities of the station sufficiently suspicious to warrant questioning and brief detentions. The officer's detention of Turner under these circumstances was not plainly incompetent or knowingly, uh, knowing um, or annoying uh, violation of the law. <laughs> and quite the big, huge reference there at the beginning of that page. <clears throat> we cannot say... Uh, when that, uh, when viewed in the light of totality, uh, totality of the ex uh, circumstances, Grinnell's and Diaz's initial questioning or detention of Turner before he was handcuffed was objectively unreasonable in light of clearly established law. Accordingly, Grinnell's and Diaz are entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's claim that they violated his Fourth Amendment right to be free from uh, detention absent of reasonable suspicion. Alright, now we're moving on to the rest. And it's quite interesting that they bring up the attacks uh, on police officers in Austin and uh, Dallas uh, there. <clears throat> Arrest. Turner also contends that the officers violated his Fourth Amendment right to be free from unlawful arrest. These parties disputed Turner's detention amounted to an arrest. A seizure rises to the level of arrest only if a reasonable per uh, person in the suspect's position would have understood the, uh, <clears throat> understood the situation to constitute a restraint on freedom of movement of the degree which the law associated with the formal arrest. The reasonable person is one who is neither guilty of criminal conduct and thus overly apprehensive nor in, uh, insensitive to the seriousness of the circumstances. When determining whether an investigative stop amounts to an arrest, it, the relevant inquiry is always one of reasonable uh, reasonableness under the circumstances which must be considered on case-by-case -case basis. Using some uh, force on a suspect, pointing uh, a weapon at a suspect, ordering the suspect to lie on the ground, and handcuffing, uh, handcuffing a suspect, uh, suspect, whether singly or in combination, do not automatically convert an, an investigatory detention into an arrest requiring probable cause. But an investigated uh, detention must be temporary and last no longer than is necessary to effectuate uh, the purpose of the stop. Turner alleges that he was handcuffed and placed in the back of the patrol car where the officers left him for a while. There is no rigid time limitation on investigative stops, but in assessing whether a detention is too long in duration to be justified as an investigative stop, we consider it appropriate to examine whether the police diligently pursued a means of investigation that was likely to confirm or dispel their suspicions quickly, during which time it was necessary to detain the defendant. Although Turner was not alleged uh, the length of time that he was detained in the back seat of a patrol car, Grinnell's and Diaz's actions handcuffing Turner and placing him in the patrol car were disproportionate to any potential threat that Turner posed or to the investigative needs of the officers. Based on the, uh, let's see, scroll down here, the allegations of Turner's complaint. The officers were not taking in, um, inve taking investigative steps to determine who he was, aside from repeatedly asking him for identification, or what threat he might be uh, might have posed. Neither does anything in the amended complaint suggest that Turner had a weapon, was using his hands in a threatening way, or otherwise posed a threat that required such restraint. The officers handcuffing Turner and placing him in a patrol car, as alleged in the amended complaint, were not reasonable under the circumstances. We conclude uh, a reasonable person in Turner's position would have understood the officer's actions to constitute a restraint on Turner's freedom of movement of the degree which law, uh, law associates with a formal arrest. Hey everyone, uh, that's tuning in. Is that PNP? Yeah, that's PNP. <clears throat> yes, I finally took in your uh, advice, PNP, and I'm reading through the Turner case now. And uh, it is quite interesting. That is to say, how often the Supreme Court keeps uh, misstating the facts on record. Every time they mention Turner, they call him a suspect without stating the suspect of what? Anybody? 
yeah, that is a, a good, uh, interesting thing. And this is not a spring court. This is appeals court. So please remember, there's three levels of courts. This is the appeals. This is the middle level. This is not Supreme Court. Supreme Court has not decided specifically on the issue of filming government officials and police uh, in this kind of matter that we do. So <clears throat> let me take a sip here and try to loosen up my voice box of all the mucus and scum from this head cold. <clears throat> As we're starting it close to the end of this, but as you can see, the appeals court does say that this constituted as a formal arrest. Okay, let's go ahead and continue on. What, what page were we just on? That was 19. Cool, we're getting close to the end of this one. All right. Whoops, that was not how that was supposed to go. Let me get this fixed again here. There we go. Okay. When police detention amounts to a warrantless arrest, as Turner alleged it did here, the arrest must be accompanied by a probable cause. Probable cause exists when to uh, totality of facts and circumstances within a police officer's knowledge at the moment of arrest are sufficient for a reasonable person to conclude the suspect and had committed or was committing an offense. <clears throat> the police may take re uh, reasonable actions under these circumstances to ensure their own safety, as well as the safety of the public during the, an encounter with a suspect. Based on the allegations of Turner amended complaint, the officers lacked probable cause to arrest him, and uh, for officers do not dispute this. Turner did not t make any threats against the officers, did not attempt to leave or flee, and did not take any aggressive actions. The only potential reason the officers gave Turner, uh, gave Turner for arresting him uh, that can be gleaned from the amended complaint is Turner's failure to identify himself. Ah, and I sort of want to stop here and, and point out this. Uh, the thing is, is sometimes it's best um, where you you got an officer. Let's say I'm doing the silent treatment and I'm getting questioned. Now, sometimes it could be a valid way of determining if they're trying to detain me or anything like that is just a straight up leave. Now, the thing is that can also work against you for giving them justification to go ahead and put you in handcuffs and detain you from uh, to make sure you don't leave the area. And so keep in mind, as is the whole legal spectrum of what we're doing is always a move, uh, just a variation of moving components that go from, I mean, that are all over the place and you can never pin down all the probabilities in a case under one specific issue. Okay, continuing on. <clears throat> he alleges that after he was handcuffed, Reynolds told him, this, was, uh, this is what happens when you don't ID yourself, but police cannot arrest an individual solely for refusing to provide identification. We are satisfied that Turner has, alle uh, has alleged a violation of his Fourth Amendment right to be free from unlawful arrest. The Fourth Amendment right to be free from arrest without probable cause was clearly established at the time Turner's alleged arrest. None of the defendants contends that any of them had probable cause to arrest Turner, or that an arrest would have been objectively reasonable in light of clearly established law. We are satisfied that no objectable, uh, objectively reasonable person in these officers' position could have believed that there was probable cause to arrest Turner under the circumstances alleged in the amended complaint. Uh, Grinnells and Diaz are therefore not entitled to qualified immunity at this stage of litigation on Turner's Fourth Amendment claim the, uh, uh, that the officers violated his rights to be free from warrantless arrest absent of probable cause. Now, this is important right here. The arrest component of the incident was, uh, according to the appeals court, is a violation of his rights. So keep that in mind. Lieutenant Driver. Okay. <clears throat> now moving on to the lieutenant. Turner insists that Driver violated his Fourth Amendment rights by continuing the unlawful seizure and subject, uh, subsequent handcuffing and arrest and keeping Turner locked in the back of the police car after Driver... Uh, arrived on the scene. 
supervisory officials are not liable under 1983 for their actions of subordinates on any theory of uh, vicariously uh, liabil uh, vicarious liability. According to accordingly, driver is not liable for the actions of Reynolds or Diaz before he arrived on scene. We thus must determine whether Turner has alleged a separate violation of his constitutional rights by driver after the uh, he arrived, and whether driver's actions were objectively reasonable and when viewed in the light of clearly established law. To be liable under 1983, driver must have been personally involved in the alleged constitutional deprivation or have engaged in wrongful conduct that is uh, casually connected to the constitutional violation. Personal involvement of supervising personnel generally include giving the command signal or other any other form of direction to the officers that prompted the detention or arrest. According to Turner allegations, he was already in handcuffs and in the back seat of the patrol car when driver arrived on scene. Turner asserts that driver talked with Grinnells and Diaz and then approached Turner to determine uh, what had transpired. The allegations of the amended complaint indicate that driver investigated the situation and immediately upon arrival by uh, consulting with Grinnells and Diaz and talking with Turner and then promptly released Turner. Turner has fa uh, failed to allege any personal involvement in his arrest or any conduct on driver's part. That indicates he has unreasonably prolonged Turner's detention or arrest. The facts allege that Turner amended the complaint and demonstrate, uh, demonstrates that drivers diligently pursued a means of investigation that was likely to confirm or dispel the officer's suspicious, uh, suspicions quickly. Turner has failed to allege that driver violated Turner's Fourth Amendment right to be free from detention absent of reasonable suspicion from unlawful arrest. Even if Turner has had sufficiently alleged a constitutional violation, driver acted uh, objectively reasonably in light of the circumstances, namely by appearing, uh, praising himself of the situation and acting accordingly. Driver therefore is entitled, uh, therefore entitled to qualified immunity on Turner's Fourth Amendment, com uh, uh, amendment complaints, uh, claims. <clears throat> Conclusion. Must well take a sip for this. We're on the last parts here and I'll field some questions I guess we affirm the district court grants qualified immunity to Grinnells and Diaz and driver uh, on Tur uh, Turner's First Amendment claim and on his Fourth Amendment claim for unlawful detention Re with respect to Turner's Fourth Amendment claim for unlawful arrest we affirm the district courts grant of qualified immunity as driver but we reverse as to Grinnells and Diaz uh, and remand for further proceedings on that claim uh, claim Affirmed in part, revised and remanded in part. Um, and then we have a dissenting opinion from Edith Brown Clement. And if I remember correctly, I think that is the female judge, which was had some quite interesting commentary within the uh, the oral uh, the oral uh, appeals portion, or well, the oral argument. Sorry. I respectfully dissent from the majority of dicta uh, purporting to clearly establish First Amendment right to film police and form the majority uh, reversal of the district court's grant of qualified immunity of Officer Grinnells and Diaz regarding Turner's unlawful arrest claim. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that qualified immunity protects all but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violated the law. Uh, see uh, Milanex v. Uh, Luna. Uh, quoting Molly V. Briggs. Okay, I think actually we've seen reference to that uh, in other case laws that we have read so far this month. The Supreme Court recently reiterated the long-standing principle that clearly established law should not be defined at high level of generality. White V. Polly. The clearly established law must be particularized in the facts of the case. Quoting An uh, Anderson V. Uh, uh, Carrington, the majority uh, uh, um, the majority asserts uh, unconnected to the particular facts and the unnecessary to the di uh, disposition of the case that the First Amendment right to record police does exist subject to only to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. The majority derives the general right to film police from First Amendment principles controlling authority and persuasive precedent, but Supreme Court has repeat repeatedly reversed attempts to define clearly established law. At such high level of generality, uh, White 
Uh, okay, I'm not sure exactly what this case is. A law not clearly established under uh, unless uh, established unless and until there is direct controlling authority, or consists of that case persuasive uh, authority. Uh, no persuasive authority such. The reason that reasonable officer should have uh, not have believed that his actions were lawful. Uh, Gonzalez v. Harrieta, a Fifth Circuit. Emphasis omitted. To the extent here is uh, there is any consensus of persuasive authority, those cases focus only on the narrow issues of whether there is a First Amendment right to film police carrying out their duties in public. And a reference to the Glick v. Cunefe. Turner did not allege that he filmed the police officers conducting uh, their public duties, but rather he filmed the police station. The majority does not determine that, a off um, that the officers here violated Turner's First Amendment rights, perhaps because it would be reasonable for security reasons to restrict individuals from filming police officers entering and leaving police stations. This is where I have a problem, in my opinion, with this uh, judge. Because the majority does not hold that the officers actually violate First Amendment, an officer acting uh, under similar circumstances in the future will not have violated any clearly established law. The majority reverses the uh, district court's grant of qualified immunity to Officer Reynolds and Diaz regarding Turner's unlawful arrest claim, holding that it was clearly established that the officer could not prolong an investigative detention without an investigatory, uh, investigatory purpose. But a majority fails to identify a case where an officer acting under similar circumstances as Officer Granos Diaz was held to have uh, violated Fourth Amendment, um, uh, referring to White case. Uh, Turner alleged only that he was in a police car. A while he failed to specify the length of the investigative detention. Perhaps more importantly, Turner clearly alleged that he was asked for a supervisor to come to the scene. Neither Turner nor majority uh, identified any case clearly established that the officer violated the Fourth Amendment. When he extended an investigation detention because he detained individual asked for a supervisor to come to the scene. Because Turner himself requested a supervisor, a reasonable police officer in that situation could believe that waiting for the supervisor to arrive at the scene did not transfer, uh, transform Turner's detention into a de facto arrest. At the very least, Officer Grenos and Diaz did not act objectively unreasonably in waiting for the requested supervisor, especially because Lieutenant Driver had to come from Fort Worth Police Station across the street. Accordingly, I respect uh, respectfully dissent from a majority's reversal in the uh, district court's grant of qualified immunity to Officers Grenos and Diaz on Turner's unlawful arrest claim. And that ends it. All right, so. Pretty much because the officers had already arrested Turner, uh, well, put him in handcuffs, detained him, put him in the police car. The act of requesting a supervisor was legitimate in extending the stop, giving immunity to the qualified, oh, well, giving, uh, and she sees that as extending qualified immunity. And it seems like I might have a dog that wants in. So let me take a quick break here, and uh, I guess we'll do a doggo cam here real fast uh, with uh, some family animals. And why don't we uh, propagate a few interesting questions for the chat that I will go ahead and uh, go over if you get, any of you have any here. So, okay, put this on chat, and I'll be back in a second. Or, and, oh, let me play some music while I'm stepping away here. Well, the doggo end up wandering off, but I could do something better. Uh, hello. Ugh. How about cattle cam?
He's already been laying here for a while, so. But what do you guys think of all of this? Quite the interesting uh, thing. Let's see here. How long have, How long did it take me? Uh, just under an hour. I actually knocked that out a lot quicker than I expected. Um, you can contact me. I have in my About section on my channel, um, there is a spot where you can click a button and bring up an email address that I put up for public to be able to send it to me. Um, and that will allow you to uh, send an email in my direction. I can answer it or respond to it. That is my uh, public contacting uh, uh, thing right there. Let's see. Uh, I'm going through the comments here. As a worded word, uh, word masters, they really are sloppy by not using the term alleged suspect. I, I sort of agree. Uh, let's see. Get into this bunny boots. Uh, let's see. Scrolling through here. Dissenting. Uh, this is dissenting judge said they failed to show the case. Said it's wrong. How can he use uh, show a case if all the require uh, all the cases require previous cases? Well, that's part of the reason why we're establishing uh, case law and all that stuff is to bring these things about. And that's what, I mean, Turner v. Driver is a big thing because it's the first time one of our uh, guys has really done that. And we probably are going to have some interesting stuff that comes out of the southeast uh, part of the United States with what's happening with Bankai and some of the others. Can I please go into qualified immunity, says Eric. Okay. Uh, the basic gist of qualified immunity is that we um, qualified immunity means that an officer can not be sued by uh, a person because of actions that they have taken uh, that they think uh, they they believe is legal in their opinion at the time of the incident. So let's say I am walking down the road and I'm smoking a cigarette. And uh, let's say I'm wearing a bunch of dark hoodie, a bunch of dark clothes and all that stuff. And an officer thinks that I might be casing a place or something like that. And so they go ahead and detain me for that. Well, um, or just end up arresting me for that because he suspects that I actually did something when he was actually wrong about that. Well, he would be uh, entitled to qualified immunity because he believes his actions are legitimate at that time and place. Um, in fact, actually, at the end of last year when I was doing those um, readings of case law, there was actually one case law that I pointed out involving an officer getting qualified immunity uh, because he believed a person uh, was, uh, well, it was legal to pull a person over for an out tail light. Or it was, yeah, it was an out tail light when the actual law itself stated that the person only needed one uh, brake light at, um, on the back of the vehicle. It doesn't require two. And so an out tail light legally did not constitute that issue. Um, I would have to go back and read on that, but I think I'll probably do a video specifically with that issue. Uh, PMP, we have uh, corrupt judges like Judge John Bishop in Bankai's case, even uh, after this case. Yes, and that is true. Uh, we are there is judges that we have to go after. I mean, a good example is what happened with, um, uh, trying to remember here, um, the guy that uh, did uh, the filming. Um, yeah, why, why am I I'm pulling up a blank? Because I talked to him several times. Um, the guy that uh, got arrested for uh, filming and protesting over at the Jacksonville airport, um, where the judge sat there and tried to prevent Pinnack from covering the uh, covering the court case with cameras and kept moving the goalpost every single time Pinnack proved that they were a viable um, news publication be able to uh, that met the standards to be able to uh, to be in the courtroom and film that case oh you know doggo showed back up oh. correction it wasn't the doggo I suspected it was going to be. Come on. You little murder. Ugh. 
Let me pop up the thing here. Here we go. We got Doggo. Well, one of the Doggos. This one's Dexter. The flip ball. He loves to beg for table scraps and stuff like that. Uh, here we go. Yes, you're getting attention. All right. Let's get back to looking at questions. Um, state Trooper repeats turn the color back. Let's see. Um, qualifying meaning in this. Whoops. Uh, Steven Sinclair. I'm trying to read through these uh, chats here. I'm looking at the thing. Oh, okay, so that was question posed to uh, News Now Alaska. I'll get back with you a little bit later, News Now Alaska. I'm feeling a little bit better, but I still got the other issue I told you about that's uh, preventing me from doing much right now. Um, can't stay long. I call a troll by their name of Zipter, and I'm hoping she will be there. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, Doggo, let me in, let me out. Another ankle biter. Yes, but that's a family owned uh, ankle biter. Uh, let's see. On your oath, Jeff, uh, Jeff Gray's friend. Um, I've tried to. Uh, dang it. He, he changed his channel name because he sort of got screwed over uh, with an MCN a while back. And I, I'm ca calling a blank on what it was that he changed it to. Uh, I recently came here to find out in here again if another uh, annotated statutes I am looking up for state annotated statutes yeah that's um, yeah the thing is is also what's nice with uh, when you actually look through these case laws here uh, bring up my little side thing here uh, when you go through and read these case laws you want to definitely check out these citations because they will make references to some stuff that happens at the state level that's within that jurisdiction and that's especially so when we read the hawaiian supreme court case that's right three cases so yeah i did read three cases um and look at these because these are important for also seeing what specific aspect they're trying to uh cause and that's something i did with the eighth circuit um earlier this year uh ruling uh that some people say is uh, that you can't film the police. In which case, in my opinion, it's actually it's more about a time reasonable time place, um, time place and manner restrictions. And so that um, if that is going to be one that I'm going to take some time to have to go through and read. Uh, hold on, let me hit this thing. My headphones want to shut down because there's no audio input coming in um, on that issue. Let's see here. Um, but yeah, it, when, as you go through these, uh, like the uh, Flores v. City uh, uh, Pelicos, 5th Circuit 2004, uh, these things, you, you want to go and look up these cases also and see if there might be any uh, further adding. And this is part of like legal research. This is what lawyers and their staff have to go through. It's like, okay, we got to write up an appeals uh, case or uh, uh, a reason for an appeal. And so what you got to do is either already have this information summarized and put this aside where you can go, okay, I, these cases apply to the situation. Let's go ahead and um, use uh, look at these and look for the actual argument. And so a majority of the paperwork that uh, goes on with uh, dealing with these cases, um, what the appeals and all that stuff, is going through other court precedents and researching that information and putting it together. Something that takes time and is not cheap. And let's uh, go ahead and get back over here to the chat window. That's yeah, all good. Let me know when you feel better. Uh, can't think of his name. Driving me crazy. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, yeah, let me see here. I know I got him. This guy. I, I know what I can do. I, I think I can pull him up. Give me a minute here. Bill, uh, airport, it, it's driving me nuts too, uh, that I can't remember. Ah, Mike Hoffman, Awaking the Masses, that's what his channel's name is. <laughs> I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, I know I, I, there should be keywords that I, it took me a minute. I, my brain's not fully processing fast enough. But Mike Hoffman, that case, that was a, a very uh, 
a big issue with a judge that uh, was trying to prevent uh, coverage of his uh, rights trampling and all that stuff. Let's see. Honor your oath, civil rights investigation. A circuit ruled no First Amendment right to film police. Um, as I said, I will be covering that one next month. That one's going to require me to sit down and put together all the information uh, that I had on that. Plus, I will be going over the lawyer that's pushing that case. He's wanting to push it to the Supreme Court and his argument. So this way you're going to hear both sides of the thing. I've actually talked with the lawyer involved in that case and on the opinion. And it's going to be quite the interesting debate. That one I want uh, everyone to, that does end up watching it to... Uh, form their own opinion based on that. Uh, what is, uh, I saw someone refer to a case it looks like, uh, Atkins v. Knight. Uh, see, what was that one about? I, I recognize that name. Was that the uh, Eighth Circuit one? Oh yeah, yeah, okay, Atkins v. Knight. Yeah, I think that is the, uh, the one I'm talking about. Yep, that, yeah, that's the, yeah. Atkins v. Knight, that's the one I will be covering later, uh, next month there. Uh, that one's going to be quite the uh, intensive one. That's probably going to be possibly go into a three or four hour stream. I I'm probably going to be uh, losing my voice by the end of that. Let's see. Right. This was the first two cops never stated. Supervisor never stated a reasonable co uh, RAS or probable cause. All of the fills. Court uh, is skewed against the people. Turner, Turner Third Circuit, Philly. FTG, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, FTG, that's what he was going by beforehand. Yeah, it's been. I haven't talked to him in a, over a year. He's been busy doing all kinds of stuff, so or almost a year, I think. It, it's been a while since I talked to him. Yeah, man, Fields v. Uh, uh, Philadelphia. That was the uh, Third Circuit that I covered uh, last week. Yeah, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, I, how should I put it? It is procedural, something like that. As I said, it's been... I originally dug through that case back in... Uh, what was it? Uh, I think it was around August. I was digging through that, and I put together quite the uh, intensive uh, study of that specific case because it was very interesting. And as I said, um, it's going to be something that's going to require some uh, some time to go through, and i got to put down together uh, put together information. So I can't do that while I'm on the go, on the road kind of thing. And FTG is still sort of in it. He's just not as uh, not as active due to the fact that he's uh, doing his uh, full-time work right now. Uh, dealing with the bills uh, that the legal costs brought about with his case. New York State is going to be difficult because of the militarization of NYPD. Well, the thing is, is with New York, um, with NYPD, um, the there is quite a few activists. You have, there's like two different cop watch groups, or at least two different channels that are watching the police there. And then you also have Sean Thomas, who has been one hell of a thorn in the, in the cop's ass over there, especially with his, um, uh, what is it, uh, the... Uh, what was it? The soda, ba uh, the soda or uh, iced tea in the, the paper bag. Uh, him cursing out the police. His vaping in the subway systems when uh, and he constantly getting the metro police sitting there saying you're not allowed to smoke. And he's going, I'm not smoking. I'm vaping. And literally, I think he's gone through actually almost either two or three uh, court cases on that specific subject matter. And is building up quite the impressive uh, legal uh, wins. And apparently he's doing this all by himself. Which, I mean, I give him credit for. And I'll probably end up... I might end up having to do a similar uh, thing myself. Uh, addresses the fact that an investigative detention does not exist without reasonable uh, applicable suspicion. Cops like to use that and are lying. Yes... Cops often like to lie when it comes to RAS. <clears throat> so, I hope that was all good. It has been about um, a little over an hour here of me live streaming. And I'm going to go ahead 
and call it an evening. I'm going to let my voice recover, get a little bit more sleep in, and deal with some other stuff and other family related stuff while I try to recover from this head cold so I can get out and do some filming and not get any more sick, which really sucks because right now the temperatures in Alaska have been, uh, the lows are hitting around uh, five or six degrees and all that stuff. And not good to do, uh, be out there filming for uh, a while while uh, in those temperatures and have be suffering from a cold. It's just not healthy and I don't want to put my health at any further risk by uh, uh, being out there sick and uh, making myself worse. But as is, um, I'm going to try to lead, uh, read at least one or two more case laws involving this. Uh, I'll probably actually do a, a sit down and read of Glick v. Cunefe and ACLV, uh, ACLU v. Alvarez. Um, if I have the time, I may even eke out a third one where I sit down and read um, at least uh, uh, Foyant v. Seattle, from, if I remember that one correctly. And that might cover all of the uh, actual case laws that deal with the First Amendment auditing, First Amendment testing, uh, or, or and police accountability or government accountability of filming buildings and officials. All right, uh, NJ Driver, I will shoot you an email um, from my other work email there uh, here in a little bit and uh, all that stuff. I got to take care of a few chores before I sit down and do any more uh, paperwork and all that stuff, or administrative work, as you probably would call it. Yeah, I hope I start feeling better, too. I'm starting to feel a little bit better compared to uh, yesterday, so. Anyway, everyone have a good night and evening, and what I'll do is I'll leave us off with some Techno Axe music. Uh, just remember that Techno Axe, he provides royalty-free music for your channels and videos and stuff like that. And, um, all you got to do is make sure you give them proper attribution in your videos. As is, you can clearly see the uh, the URL and the title and all that stuff for the music that I have used this evening. And yes, thanks to the Potosi who put his butt on the line and actually pushed that case. Uh, who knows, maybe with the uh, what happened with the U.S. Marshals, I will be able to push a case on that and establish some precedent too. And good evening.